What's up, everyone, and welcome to another World's Finest Edition of the All-Star Comics Podcast. I'm your host, Jonathan Cote. Joining me on the panel are Roger and Matt, and this is our special Artist Edition episode. So today we are joined by our special guests, Ray. Say hello. Uh, hi. <laughs> and Chris. <laughs> and uh, today our, uh, we are going to be kind of interviewing and finding out like what it is to be or what it takes to be an artist in the comic book industry. So... Let's yes. go ahead and jump into some conversation, Roger. Yeah, well, I, th I think that both of you would probably agree that this is probably a cautionary tale. Yes. <laughs> episode. Yes. Okay. Could be, yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things I wanted to do starting off is to look at because you know a lot of kids out there, including myself, when I was young and getting into comics, wanted to be a comic artist. You know. Yeah. And then life happens. <laughs> um, yeah. Everyone wants to draw Spider-Man. And then, well, for me, it was when I got into high school, and you go into art class, and you and I, and I was like, "Oh my God, <laughs> I'm I'm not that good. I better <laughs> I better stick to science." So what are your earliest memories of just drawing and wanting to draw, whether it involves comics or something else? You know what, um, Chris? Uh, I don't really remember anything before I was eleven. Nothing traumatic happened. Uh, my brain is lazy. <laughs> uh, but my my best friend likes to tell this story that in the first day of fifth grade, the teacher was talking and I was drawing. I used to draw the old school Marvel letterboxes and all my pages. Like so, on my papers, I would draw that that profile Spider Man face, and then that's where I would put my name and the date. <laughs> that's awesome. It, yeah. I'm uh, to this day I'm shocked I ever got laid. But <laughs> I. So I guess in the fifth grade I was drawing already, and my best friend looked over and he's like, "Hey, I'm Wes," and I was like, "Hey, I'm Chris." And he said, "When I grow up," he said that I said, "When I grow up, I'm gonna draw comic books," but I don't remember that. Um, he likes to tell that story though. <laughs> that's awesome, yeah, that's right? Cool. Uh, mine isn't as cool as Chris's. Uh, and I know this is on camera. I might look all jacked up, so, <laughs> you know. Uh, but um, I think my earliest memory is. Uh, drawing Mighty Mouse and uh, and, and the Spider-Man from remember the 1960s you know like cut and paste animation that used to come on uh, where they got the theme song um, so yeah. I used to draw that stuff and my thing was maybe that's my love affair with animation came in it wasn't until uh, later on where someone um, I would go to 7-Eleven and I would see these comics on the rack it's like Holy crap! Spider-Man's right there. It's not just a cartoon, so that that was kind of it. Like, but I've been drawing since I was like, I, I remember four years old. What was the issue that gave you the bug where you're like, this is this is my life? West Coast Adventures, mm. uh, the mini series. Um, so yeah, I fell in love with the comics, and I was like, uh, this is awesome. That was like Hawkeye, yeah. Mockingbird. Yeah, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure I can. Tigra. <laughs> Oh, Wonder yeah. Man, yeah, um, Rhodey. Okay, I hate, I mean you know people watching this podcast. Huh. I never liked Iron Man, and I still don't. <laughs> War Machine's um, way cooler. <laughs> uh, yeah, War Machine sucks too. <laughs> <laughs> That's a look. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, yeah, I wasn't a big fan, but every every character there in West Coast Avengers, I still to this day have a certain affinity for. Like Chris and I were talking about, are there people on the list? Right, yeah. those characters are on my list. Uh, you know, she Hulk was in there. Um, but yeah, like that was it. What about you? Like, yeah. uh, I was in the comics, so I remember like really caring about what was happening uh, during the Siege Perilous X Men, or whatever it was called. So yeah. X Men 246, maybe? Yeah. I didn't know what was going on. I just knew it was cool. And then Archie's Ninja Turtles was a big thing for me. That was like my first subscription. But then X Men 275 was the no turning back. Look at this. Refresh my memory. What's 275? 275 I'm never was, uh, yeah, all the X Men were in the, the blue and gold costumes, even Wolverine. Uh, they were fighting the Shire, and oh, Jim, the Jim Lee, Lee had cover. the triple fold out cover. Yeah. And I just remember that cover, and I was like, dude, this is it. And he <laughs> took Gladiator, who hadn't really looked cool before, but the Jim Lee Gladiator was on point, and I just, that was it for me. I was like, I need to, and I probably drew every panel of every comic Jim Lee drew 
for the next six years. Wow. I'm sure I did. That's, that's, that's Jim Lee, right? Yeah. But yeah, and I and I, I didn't get it, but that was, he was the first, but I don't think I'm unique in that. I think pretty much any dude my age, Jim Lee, it, you're either Jim or you're Todd or you're Rob. Yeah. Those sure. three guys, if you wor- grew up worshiping artists, which it's hard for people to understand now, like these guys had tour buses. Yeah. It, like, it was crazy. They were rock stars. the first <laughs> rock stars of comics, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I remember that time. I'm, I'm a little older than you. Mm-hmm. And uh, my my guys were, um, we just talked about them, like uh, John Byrne and uh, Art Adams, uh, Jose uh, Luis Garcia Lopez. Uh, who else? Those old, older guys, you know. Yeah. I like that. But then, trust me, when the Image guys came and, um, like, I love McFarlane, you know, because he was unique. Like, that stuff was crazy, you know. It was, it was really cool. And Jim Lee, he was just, I don't know. Like, I, I was, I liked them both, but I was a Mark Silvestri guy. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who, out of that group, was probably the most skilled. Maybe that's it. Because it was like, God, you know, everything was beautiful. It was gritty and beautiful at the same time. I've never seen anything like that before. You know, I mean, Barry Wrights and... Uh, uh, Bernie Wrightson was was great with the with the detail and, and the crazy like, beast. Yeah, but you can't draw Frankenstein without fr- Swamp Thing Frank. either. Yeah, like I don't even you know somebody at a convention had me draw Swamp Thing and I'm like I can't draw Swamp Thing. <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's just wrong. It's just wrong for me to draw Swamp Thing. So I'm I'm not Bernie. I can't do it. Um, but yeah, like these characters like that I think are, are gorgeous. Um, but you know those those old guys like uh, you know Jim Lee and the guys that we're talking about are great. But there's dudes that work, and you can tell they didn't grow up with that love. Yeah, that's true. And those are the guys that'll work, and they doesn't mean they're any less talented or whatever. But you can tell, yeah, in a couple of years, that guy's going to go make some money on a video game. He's going to – and that's not even calling out any one guy. That's just like it's a business model. I get that. Right. And I think you have to have that love to stick around. You do because you can't do it for money. That's true. <laughs> passion, passion has to be what drives you. Yeah, that's, that was kind of like uh, the Joe Mad. He did books and he did like two big video games, the whole art style for the Dark Siders games. Mm-hmm. And that they sold a lot of copies because of that style. Uh, I gotta tell you, with Joe, Joe, he has the same issue as a lot of us. He loves too many things. He loves comics, but he loves video games, and and you know, and he also loves animation and. Um, he wanted to do everything, you know, and I, I don't fault him for it. And he, yeah, he's so skilled a, sco- a storyteller that he could do that. Yeah, well, that's true. He, yeah. he yeah. steps into to a completely different medium yeah. and hasn't let people down. No, every time he, yeah. you know, pops up, if he does the three That's amazing, art, and there's not yeah, a lot of people yeah, yeah. that can do that. No. Yeah. So, um, going off the do have you, either of you guys have any formal art classes? Like, Chris, I know you said you were recreating all of Jim Lee's panels yeah. for, for all that time. At Not just point, Jim Lee, but yeah. Um, are you self-taught? Or yeah. Really? Completely? Yeah. That's, That's awesome. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't graduate high school in time because uh, I think things are funny that a lot of people don't think are funny. <laughs> <laughs> and on the last day, so I went to high school for four and a half years because on the last day of my senior year, I failed art, um, and I had to go to summer school just for an elective. One credit. Five credits. So five. Failed <laughs> art. I failed art, yeah. That's <laughs> how ironic. Right? That's, that's, that's insane. insane. It's fine. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> my parents my parents aren't mad at it unless you bring it up. <laughs> Ray, any formal um, training? You know, I, I was mostly self-taught. I mean, um, I would say I had two stages of uh, formal training, but it was my self-taught, you know, skills that got me the jobs. So I used to teach uh, fine art um, for Mission Renaissance. Uh, this famous uh, watercolor, Larry Gluck, opened up a bunch of schools. So you know, I took the test or whatever it was, the art thing, and his whole thing was you could teach anybody art. <laughs> right? Yeah, <you> and um, <laughs> <laughs> when I got in there. Um, they were like, oh, you can already draw. Like, you can do all this stuff. We're going to move you up. And you're going to start teaching people. Well, I didn't know how to 
do any oil painting. So really, I, that's what I learned. I learned how to do watercolor and oil painting. Everything else I pretty much knew, and it was kind of fun because we had, um, uh, first time I ever had, um, what is it, life drawing classes? Mm -hmm. That was really cool. Um, but uh, other than that, like, and then I left that job and I started um, school. I went to this rinky-dink, uh, you know, college, Brooks mm -hmm. uh, College Art and Design. And I wanted to go and graphic designer because I was like, well, I get a little certificate or something to so tell people yeah. I've finished something, right? Let's start. Right. Uh, so I bring my portfolio in because that's what I thought you were supposed to do. Apparently not. Again, rinky dink, right? I'm thinking this art center. No. So I get there and they're like, oh, you know, I want to do graphic design. I want to do this stuff. And I'm like, okay, let's see what you got. No, you're not going to do graphic design. We're starting this animation program. This is our first year. We want you to do that. I was like, but I really want to do, no, you got to do this animation thing. I was like, well, I want to get the certificate or whatever. I never did. Because, you know, I think a year after I left, they lost their accreditation. Uh, but they had some, yeah, they had a, um, really good people there. They had instructors. And uh, the last time I was there, I was going to intern at Film Roman. I didn't take that job because I ended up getting a job uh, with Tidal Wave or some kind of comic company. Whatever happened and it fell through. And I was like, shit, can I did say you, that? Did you yeah. actually... Um, yeah. Did you actually produce pages for Tidal Wave? I did. did. Were you ever paid for said pages? Like other companies, no. <laughs> <laughs> other companies that I'd like to mention, but not. Uh, no. Uh, but, yeah, it was cool. I mean, as a matter of fact, I got in there after, um, like, Mark Brooks was doing, he and I were good friends, and I still are. And he's like, yeah, I'm doing this book called Atlas, mm -hmm. and they need somebody to take over for me. And I was like, oh, wow, you know, this is, this is it, you know, gonna, gonna do. and it was that image at that time. So this is 2001. Something like that, yeah. yeah. So I was like, okay. Uh, yeah, you're better at dates, man. Like, yeah. Dates you, and numbers. You've got some encyclopedic you knowledge. It's comic yeah. books. It's yeah. only comics. <laughs> yeah, right, right? If it relates to something, you can remember. I was doing backups for that book. Oh, seriously? Yeah. Six Degrees, man. That's one thing I find in comics. Like, everybody somewhere, like, it doesn't take uh, six degrees. It's more like three. Yeah you work with somebody but yeah that book fell through like it got canceled and i was like yeah. a few pages in and um but i made good people it was cool um and yeah i didn't get paid for that <laughs> but and i also lost my film roman thing so oh. but i recovered it was cool i made good people yeah i i never had the pages published I, maybe they were published and i just don't know they weren't published either. um <laughs> i mean unless unless you did backups for the mark brooks stuff yeah, I think so. If you did that, then they did get published. Oh, no, maybe I did the backups for 10th Muse. I don't remember anymore. Oh, I did this, some 10th Muse stuff, but I was already kind of sullied on yeah. that, and I was like... <sighs> the, uh, the, coolest, the only th good thing that I got out of that, they had asked me to sign at the booth, and they, were, they had a bunch of young guys. Hmm. I wonder if you were there. Maybe. Um, I wasn't was, a young guy, though. It was San Diego. I was really young. So I was like 20, 21. Mm -hmm. And Mark Brooks is there. Met him very briefly. And then he, they were like, kind of like uh, cast off. He was like, well, you just go sit over there. So I sit next to this dude who's super nice. Sean, uh, Sean Murphy. What? Uh, you got a Sean Murphy story? I got one and, too. <laughs> and so this dude is just slamming out super simple, super fast, beautiful commissions. And at the time, he was drawing very clean. Very, very clean. Yeah, style was completely different then. Um, and we had we had a really good conversation. Honestly, I didn't think I'd ever see him again. And then two years later in San Diego, he actually pulled me aside. He had just gotten burned by DC. And we probably talked for 20 minutes. He was, he was on fire with not work, but the way he was selling himself yeah. was so well done he was doing he had done uh, an autobiographical comic at Oni called Off Road um, I so. uh, but yeah and so I haven't talked to him in a couple years only because you don't want to be that guy yep um, <laughs> but but yeah like for Pretty a while cool. there he always always returned to emails he always nice man he always had he always knew he was going through it and wasn't afraid to share it. Those are the nicest guys. Yep. 
hundred percent honest with you all the time. He, you know, there's a stigma I think in this industry where you want to hold some stuff close to the vest that really it's no point in, you know. Yeah. But Sean is so forthright with the stuff he talked about. Like we were talking about before the, the show started, the podcast started about confidence, right? So I just got this job, and I think if it wasn't that year, it was uh, maybe a year after, and um, Sean was working with Tidal Wave or whatever they were called at that point, and I told him how basically inadequate I felt. You know, and um, I was like, "Yep." I said, "I'm following Mark," and at that time, like Mark is a beast now, but he, he, you could see back then that dude was going to be amazing. And so I'm following him, and I was like, "Yeah, I don't know if I'll be able to do this," you know, whatever. And I'm walking to the floor, and Sean's walking with me, and we're talking about this. He's like, dude, so I've seen your work. You know, it's really good. There's some things that you're very strong at, you know, and, and like, just good advice and just uh, the nicest dude. But he was the first guy I ever thought, before I even knew what the name was, like, he was branding himself. Mm -hmm. He was branding himself early. Smart guy, smart guy, just nice, so... Yeah, but you're right. Like people like that, um, Todd Knock, who's now a family friend of mine, um, he, uh, another guy, just shares information freely, ask him anything. Great, great guy. And affable. Oh yeah, he's one of next to. I mean, well, he's at the top. The next, the next, nicest next person I've ever met, um, artist-wise, is uh, Sean Galloway. Mm -hmm. uh, super nice guy, and, you know that's the, the guys I like I, you know I don't like these guys that are kind of like um, you know I have this prestige you know I've done all this work and you know you basically have to get in line to talk to me <laughs> like that kind of stuff I, I hate that I just I really do it's comics dude nobody it's not brain surgery you know so yeah I take. there's still people right yeah, mm -hmm. I, I'm unafraid to talk people to people who are not so <laughs> not people, not people. Not people. <laughs> I would question whether or not they're people I'm a people <laughs> <laughs> With that being said, like, those two guys especially, if you ever needed to be convinced, and I don't believe in anything, but if I believed in karma, they mm. would be prime examples of why good things happen to good people. Yes, That's yes. Cool. They seem to be very healthy individuals. Yes. They know how to communicate well. Uh, they promote positivity in, in nice things. And then there's been other times where I've had a couple creators who have just been the opposite of that. <laughs> and later on, I've heard just bad things that have happened to them. And I don't, I'm not, I've never been the type, type of guy that's been like, well, that's good. Um, <laughs> but, but I also don't really <coughs> question why those things happen. I'm like, that's, whew, that's bad. But so one, get of back the, up. one of the things here I think that, that, you know, is, is important to point out is not only does it take a great amount amount of talent, whether or not you're self-taught or you're, you know, well-schooled, but there's, you know, one of the most important aspects in the industry is networking. Yeah. That's it's what I'm the worst at. <laughs> I'm super good at it. There you go. <laughs> I'm a better networker than I'm an artist. Oh, Ray. <laughs> I don't know about that. Calm down. <laughs> Dude, there, I have a, a nickname, like, a, a, you know, even the publishers, like my the CEO, the publisher of Action One, he's like, Ray knows everybody, you know, because um, let's just, I can't say any names, but people will have come to me, or maybe I've already said some names, um, they're like, dude, let me hook up with Action Lab, you know, I'm looking for a publisher, it's not, but no, they're basically like, I'm the dude that connects other people with other people. Oh, because I, I guess yeah, I've been yeah. doing it so long. I've met so many people. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just, just weird to me. And it's uh, I don't think about it. Like, I don't think about it. It's just, oh, yeah. No. And so people are like, you know, that guy. I'm like, yeah, I met him like 10 years ago. It's dude, you know, you've been in the industry a long time. You get to kind know of. people well, kind of. long yeah. enough. Yeah. But at the same time, like I've worked in studios with legendary people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's not a slam on him. I don't think Mark Sylvester, he might remember me if he was reminded. I guarantee you he doesn't know my name. Wow. And I would be shocked if he knew my work. And that's not a slam on him. Okay. It's just that, uh, yeah, I. it took me a long time. Like, I didn't even go to conventions for a long time because I just didn't think I was up to the standard. Like, I knew, I was, 
whatever it was, I had to work on this or I had to work on that. And then I didn't like my style. Uh, I've never met anybody who said, even on the internet, I've never, which isn't a challenge, <laughs> but I have never met anybody who has critiqued me as hard as I critique myself. You won't. Yeah. I, uh, I have a hard time. And a lot of time, I spend enough time every day going, is this done? Am I, did I, t- did I top out a year ago and people just being nice? <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't, I'm not good at, I don't, I don't want to talk to people and feel like I'm trying to get something out of them mm-hmm. unless I'm going to come up and I'm going to say, Hey, may I ask you this question? Um, but I'm not, I'm not great at that. And especially as I got older and I started to realize where my anxieties are and stopped, you know, uh, pretending there weren't anxieties. Yeah. Um, then it, it sort of became harder because then you don't have anything to hide behind. It's more like, well, now I actually have to talk to these people. And it's not that I don't want to talk to them. It's that I don't want to bother. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's really hard for me. And I, there's a lot of people where I'm like, I don't think I'm at that level where I can, I can, I just don't want to waste anyone's time. You know what I mean? So for me, I don't feel like I'm through that 80% of garbage that you got to work through to get to the 20% of good. Yeah. And even in the last probably year or two, when I finally opened up a commissions list, like I was not about to do commissions that people would look down on. So I just didn't do it. Like, I don't care if it was a $20 commission. I wasn't going to do that. Right. Um, it's only lately that I, I can feel like I can look myself in the mirror and do commissions. Wow. And sometimes, you know, sometimes it just doesn't. I don't know. I don't, I don't let myself not do that. So I just, like, kept focusing and focusing and focusing. But I didn't, I didn't understand a lot of, like, those drinking draws. Like, I would love to do that, but at the same time, like, if I don't have a driver, then what am I going to do? You know what I That's mean? That's true. Yeah. If you're going to drink. <laughs> yeah. And you can't, I'll I don't laugh. know. If you're going to go down there and you're not that good, drinking ain't going to make you any better. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to embarrass myself in front of people. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, obviously confidence is something that I, I'm constantly struggling with. Which is funny, so then when other people get pissed or whatever, you know, like, that guy's fucking full of himself. Whoops. Are we using the F word here? Yeah, it's fucking exclusive. <laughs> yeah. I am. That's fine. I and, used the uh, S word a minute ago. They use that on Fox now. You're okay. <laughs> oh, all right. Um, yeah, so it's it's just really hard for me to to be okay with that idea that even in portfolio reviews, it was always like, well, work on this or work on that. And then when a small press guy goes, well, I need a guy for 12 issues and I think I'd only get you for six or seven. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not a flake, you know? And they're like, yeah, well, DC needs a lot of artists and they will steal you. And you're like, oh, well, that's a compliment, but now I'm still out of work, you know? Yeah. 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 How hard is it to get a job at Marvel in DC? It depends on how long you've been doing it. If you've been drawing for two years and you don't like your factory job or maybe you work at Sprint and you're like, you know what, I'm just going to draw comics. You're not going to work at Marvel or DC in that first year. There's no way. Marvel especially wants, they don't want to train you. They want you to know how to make comics before they even consider you, which is fair. They don't owe you an education. You have to bring that to the table. But what they would like is for you to also bring your best work. And that's all right, but that means doing it on your own. You need to understand that an audience is not guaranteed. And that's humbling. That's very humbling. Because what are you trying to say? What can you boil it down to? Um, Because when you get a book for a major publisher, you're not, as an artist, you're not going to have as much to say. You don't get to. You do what you can with what you're given. Um, The artist doesn't have the power they may have at one point. 
maybe they shouldn't have as much power as they had at one point. There's always going to be a balance, and one doesn't work without the other. We've tried it both ways now. Um, but if you can't network, you won't work at either one. Yep. I don't know anyone at Marvel. Yeah. Um, I had a Marvel editor email me because of a commission, a, a really dumb commission, <laughs> <laughs> that she thought was hilarious. Can we, can we ask what the commission was? It was a spider Gwyn. No, it was a Gwynpool. Mm. And she was making like uh, a cap and a Bucky pop kiss each other. Oh my god, I love oh. that cover. And, <laughs> and she thought she thought it was adorable and thought it was fantastic. And I said, "Wow, thanks." And she was like, "She was like, you should do more of these sketch covers." And I was like, <laughs> I, "I do." <laughs> <laughs> um, what editor was that? Uh, the Can we drop names? I, if I remember her name, I feel pr- really bad right now. Is it Heather? Yeah. Heather's yeah, cool. Um, but yeah, it was... You do know everybody, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, See, I didn't even think about it. <laughs> but then I probably could have turned that into a conversation. I didn't want to bother her. Wow. But didn't she approach you? Yeah. Yeah, she gave me a compliment, and that was very nice, and I appreciate that compliment. She opened the door, yeah. and she's so nice. She's super nice. I didn't know what to say. <laughs> That's what it comes down to is ignorance on my part. Like I was like, I don't, I don't really know what to say oh. without being pushy. You, you need know? a wingman. You yeah. do. I'd be happy to, you know. <laughs> but no, I mean, I, I swear. To say you got to have somebody to kind of. <laughs> but it's it's and this industry is so you know, I don't know. It's like nepotism. I don't know, but. I met Heather through Mark Brooks, and you know, and it's all online. I haven't, we haven't physically met, but you know, it's, it's, she just seems like a really nice person, and mm-hmm. it's real cool. And I don't know, like my thought, um, I guess my my rule of thumb when I go out into the conventions and stuff like that. First of all, like my wife and I say, uh, you know, oh, it's time to be on, right? Because when I'm at home. Like, I'm a dad, you know. You know like, I'm I'm in dad mode all the time, and um, usually I'm pretty quiet. And as most artists are, we're introverted. You know, mm-hmm. um, I enjoy my solitude. Uh, but you know, I guess I walk the line. So my thought when I go out there is like, everyone here is just like me. There is no difference, yeah. and that's the mantra right before I walk through the door. And once I go in, I just talk to whoever, man. Like, you know, because they're looking at you. Sometimes people are looking at you to say something because I think in our industry we have anxiety. All of us have some kind of anxiety. Mm-hmm. So somebody's got to take the first step. It's like dating, right? Like you can't be looking at a girl and it's like, you know, she's looking at you and she's waiting for you to say something. You're waiting for her to say something. Somebody's got to say something. You know, and that's mm-hmm. what's so weird is that I didn't know how many introverted people were in comics <laughs> and how many people, like, had a hard time dating. I've always been really lucky. Mm-hmm in dating <laughs> um, but that's because I'm full of shit <laughs> use that with your comics um, not working. but as I've gotten older it's that's not a trait that I appreciate in myself and so I have tried to but then I'm like well if I if I'm not full of shit I'm pretty sure I'm empty <laughs> so wh- what do I do what, you know what, like one is better than the other <laughs> yeah and so <laughs> And so it's one of those things where I've heard people compare that to dating, and I'm like, no, no, because, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, like, yeah, it's different. Well, maybe is that why you didn't want to reply to Heather? Because maybe you didn't want to see her know that you're full of shit? I would yeah. prefer nobody <laughs> knows I'm full of shit, but I, no, I'm at knows. least honest, but I'm at least honest enough to be like, uh, I would assume a good 80% of everything I say is full of shit, but it's probably not that high anymore. But there's a maturity in it, too. You have to be disciplined enough. I, I'm i I'm fairly harsh when people ask me, oh, I like to draw. I want to do comics. What should I do? Mm-hmm. And I'm like, are you willing to devote six hours, seven days a week to focused drawing? Yeah. yeah. That's are you willing to draw things that are not fun? How many fire hydrants can you draw? <laughs> How many different kinds of a cell phone can you draw and make it look interesting? Like, maybe you like Michael Turner's artwork and he draws beautiful women, but how much do you know about Gil Kane? Yeah. Have you ever sat down and studied Toth's layouts? 
yeah. uh, Darwin Cook's compositions. You need. You are name dropping like a big dog. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you need to. You need to look at what is produced as entertainment, and look at them as textbooks. Yeah. I don't like when people hit me up on social media, and they hey check out my stuff, and I, I I'll look at it, and I don't want to tear anybody up. But when you hashtag uh, self taught, you are creating an excuse for yourself. It doesn't matter. Nobody cares. I, it took me a really long time to understand that. Nobody cares if you went to school. Nobody cares mm, yeah. if you went to SCAD or you went to Arts Center or you went to Cal Arts, uh, Or if you sat in your garage and, you know, you just focused. You focus on art books. You drew the same hand 15 different ways. If you have a book of left hands, that tells me you're thinking about how these things work. Yeah. You're putting puzzles together, and you have to be a puzzle builder if you want to do it. Makes because sense. it's okay to start out and see a guy's style that you like and adapt part of that. Everyone does that. Yeah. But eventually, naturally, I remember thinking, I was like, when I was probably in junior high, I was like, I think all the good styles are taken, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, it would be cool. If there were five Art Adams, but the reason Art Adams is cool is because there's one. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of people who started there and branched out. You know? You're preaching the gospel of artists right now. You really <laughs> yeah. are. Because yeah. everything, I swear, everything Chris is saying right now is like, boom, boom, boom. He's hitting all the points. And as a seasoned artist, you just don't have time to hear people's bullshit. You and don't, and I'll know, call them on it. You just don't, right? Yeah. It's like, okay, well, what have you done? Yeah, you know, I, I want to be an artist. Well, you, you're you not good at drawing hands. You need to draw hands. And then they make that face, you know, and it's the face that says, it's like they're hurt, they're butt hurt, and part of them wants to listen, the, the actual smart guy in them wants to listen, but the ego, the ego is cracked, oh. and they they just shut off. They don't want to hear that. They want to hear that they want to work on hands. They want to hear how good they are. Right. They want to hear how awesome hear that, that pose is. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, I can't tell you that. Because not everyone is. No. So I just mitigate the whole conversation. Um, you know, the same way as Chris. I was like, well, to be a master at anything, it takes 10,000 hours of doing the same thing over and over again. How many hours do you put in? And, was, and they were counting. One kid was like, that's like five years. I was like, Exactly. And but five that's years, five years. Five years is nothing. Right. It's yeah. nothing. In the it's long term? Blink of an eye. Yeah. Uh, but you see really smart people, and that's how you know. I don't like the word talent. Talent is a word that people who have active social lives and hang out at bars and are caught up on every television show and every <laughs> comic book use for the time that I spend all by myself at a desk trying to figure out body language you like and then when people ask me like oh well how do I get better at that I'm like well you need a life draw you need a life draw every day well I don't have time for a class and I'm like then you can go to the mall and you could watch people stand in line everybody stands differently yep how think about the drapery you're not always going to draw spandex and especially in a diversified comic book field you're not going to draw spandex very often. I don't know if I have ever drawn spandex. No, I have. But that's... I had to think. I just... I had completely forgotten. <laughs> one of those there's back. less it's superheroes. And you should be thankful that there's less superheroes. Yeah. If you went to the movies and all they had was westerns, you're going to get sick of the movies. Because yeah. you've seen enough westerns. I love comic books for that. I don't have to go out of my way to find a good crime book, a good right. horror book. Back in the day, you didn't have that. That's true. You know, occasionally you'd have an American Splendor or, you know, a random independent book. Love and Rockets. Yeah. yeah. Those things, now, that's, it took a few years for them to figure out what a gift they gave us, but the image founders when you meet them you should shake their hand for that because yeah. yes they made superhero books initially but they've also outgrown that and not in a bad way 
Invincible is still one of the best comic books around. Still. Yeah. For another year. Like I said, this guy is still. preaching. Yeah. It's, what, it's, my, it's the book that I buy consistently, and I was yeah. saddened. I didn't find out when it happened, when they decided to end the thing. I don't know what I was doing, and then I just popped up online. It's like, yeah, you know, Kirkman's ending in his. It's like, no. Yeah. That's pretty much my reaction. Oh my yeah. god! Because I learned yeah. everything about ten, that book. Yeah. Ten months left, I think, yeah. and it's over. Yeah, yeah. ends at one forty-four. That's yeah. it. But yeah, I mean, it's it's a uniquely hard job in art. Yeah. Um, you don't get the pass that a lot of other kinds of art gets. There's not. It's not this assembly line, so that. If you're having an off day, someone else can fix it and keep going. Right. You're responsible for everything. I don't know any other form right. of art where you are regularly drawing people, cars, capes, lighting. I don't like to compare it to movies. But the the weirdest thing is when people really want to draw comics and they ask, like, oh, well, I like the way your characters act. And I go, yeah, watch a silent movie. Like, right. don't watch just a comedy. But, like, I remember... Uh, knowing my drawing was stiff but not knowing how to fix that and then I started watching all these Harold Lloyd silent movies they couldn't rely on words so you're taking your letter out of it yeah. and you're going to carry that burden well how do you do that uh, and, and Greg Capullo is probably the best at this um, I don't think he was watching silent movies but I am positive he was watching Chuck Jones cartoons. Oh yeah, clearly. Uh, a large part of a lot what what you guys are seem to be talking about is you have to be really observational and know like have a keen eye on on what it is just to fix in your own stuff and then how to look at a lot of that before you turn anything in. I think it's it's the final job of the artist is to self evaluate. Yeah. Turn like look at the reverse image. So you can see those faults, hopefully before you've inked anything. <laughs> and don't make your editor be the bad guy when you're the one who dropped the ball. Yeah. Your editor is not just editing your book. If he's talking to five or six other artists, yeah. don't make his job harder. He yeah. hired you. Mm -hmm. Make his job as easy as possible. That makes sense. Yeah. And accept that you won't always be the hero of your story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's hard for anybody. But that's important I think this job there's no um, uh, health insurance and no sick days right um, like right now like I'm super sick but I got three pages to do today well really two and a half I did most of it but like you know I'm heavily medicated <laughs> right now uh, from my boy Roger and um, but dude I was thinking God you know I wish I had help but you know when you do this and you're you don't really want help you want to no. do it your, you want to do it yourself and like I, you know like a couple of days ago i think friday um i'm trying to crank these pages out because again like i have i'm lucky i have cool editors and the things i'm working on right now you know um are really good projects and i remember sitting there and i you know i could barely see and i literally passed out with a pencil in my hand and i got well, i woke up like four hours later um, you know, and I, of course I found out, you know, I had a major fever, but I was like, dude, I gotta finish these pages. It's the only thing I can think about. It's only like right now when I leave, I'm going right to go finish some pages because I have to have at least three pages turned in by Monday. Yeah. So, you know, but here's what the crazy thing is. I don't feel bad about, you know, the crunch and I don't feel bad that I'm, you know, I feel bad that there's a possibility I could let my editor down. Mm-hmm. That's the only thing I feel bad about. And also, this is, it's a stress that you've chosen. Right, the exactly. The stress you choose is always going to be better than the stress you don't choose. Exactly. And when people don't understand the difference, that's when you find unhealthy people. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, they, sometimes that, I'm glad you said that. Those are people I don't think, um, they don't understand what it is to be free. Because we take all the sacrifice upon ourselves. Right, you know, we, this volunteer. We don't have to draw comics. We don't have to write comics. We don't have to do this. I think I do. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, I was going to get to that. You, there's a calling, right? Yeah. When you don't draw, it's like you're going through withdrawals. That's yeah. how I feel. I feel like any time I've I've made a choice that's against where my like 
the river of my life seems to be taking me. Mm-hmm. Anytime I go against that, life smacks me hard. Karma. And it's, uh, it's I don't even know about karma because it always, it, it hasn't always been like bad choices. <laughs> um, but it's usually like there's a course correct in there that I have no choice in. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I'm not good at anything that makes a lot of money. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> well, most people are. It's yeah, like uh. you know, I I spent six months managing a comic book shop, and I didn't understand. I I just assumed that every manager of a comic book shop could tell you exactly when X artists started on X Men, or they could tell you how many issues Avengers Forever ran. Right. I don't know why I remember that. <laughs> it, but see, Chris, it all comes down to comics, though. The things that are important to you, they always rise to the surface. Yeah. Because you worked at a comic shop. You're a comic book artist. You probably, you know, wake up thinking about comics every morning to some degree. Probably. Yeah. I mean, that's your life. You know, and it, it's a calling. And you're right. Like, when you you go against the stream, against the current, something feels off. Mm-hmm. Like, you're not right. I worked in, in corporate uh, America for a while, um, you know, in the mail room doing medical billing. And every day I spent there. It sounds like prison. <laughs> and it was. It was good money. Everything was cool. But, like, when I was talking about the full-time job. So I would come home. And I would, we, we had one car between us. Um, so I was taking the bus. And I would get up at 5 Oof. to go to this job that um, I lived in Carson and I worked in Century City and then I would work nine hours take the bus two hours again so I'm home by eight Uh, I would draw for three hours and then draw on the weekends and then just start the whole thing over again Um, you know I try to squeeze in time with my family but that was the only thing that I could make sense that would make right for me to to work those nine hours at that crappy job and it wasn't crappy but it was hell. It was hell. It was, yeah. like, you know, I don't know. So your art ended up being more therapy. Yes, have you, yes. Have you ever been angry at that drive, though? Like, don't you think your life would be easier if right now you were at home arguing on Facebook about football? Yep. And you couldn't wait till next Friday? Like, I will never understand a life. Now, I might work every single weekend, but if you live for your weekends... You are wasting a too large a percentage of your life. Yeah. That's crazy to me. Like, I grew up with blue-collar folks, you know? And I never... I understood the sacrifices that they made for me and my, and my sister, but I didn't understand that mentality of, you know, like, that Sunday night dread. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that to me, be like, we gotta go to you go to school, or <laughs> we gotta do something. But those are generally people that just come home after work. Yeah, they look forward yeah. to it. And if, but even then, if there's you know, if there's nothing on TV, I'll never be the type of guy that will get home from work and watch the same episode of Two and a Half Men <laughs> and eat the same thing I eat every Tuesday. Yeah, and that's okay. And I don't even think it's bad for people who do that. But but I know it's not for me. And unfortunately, that's cost me a lot of relationships. That's the biggest issue with, with this job. Because you'll meet a lot of people uh, that don't understand what you do and the sheer passion that you have for it. My wife calls it my mistress, but she's okay with it. We have a, a good, you know, thruple kind of thing going on. <laughs> so... You know, but that's what you want and someone who's going to share your life, that they get it. They mm-hmm. get that they're not the only person. Not to say it's they're not the important person. They can be very important. But this is something very important. It is your partner. You know, I mean, just listen to Chris. Think about all the stuff that, like, it's, it's part of your life. It's like waking up and looking in the mirror and you're seeing this. And in the back of you is your passion for comics. It's not going away. Uh, you know, and people um, on the outside world, they some people don't get it. I mean, because it's not about money. They're like, oh, you know, you're spending all this time, like you work harder, uh, 
you know, than a lot of people, and you only get this much money? Yep. Yeah. You always hate yourself when you've broken down your, your hourly wage. Yeah, oh, yeah. Like, what? That is an exercise in pain. <laughs> but, but to get back to when people ask you questions at conventions, like there's the self-taught folks who use that as an excuse for why they can't figure out proportions and refuse to open a book and learn where Google things. We didn't have Google. I know. This is a great time to be an uh, artist. But then you have the other type that I shut down just as hard. We're like, well, I can't, I can't draw unless I'm stoned. And I'm like, well, then you need to talk to someone about that <laughs> because you're limiting your creative output. And I'm not going to get super anti-drug because that would be hypocritical. <laughs> uh, but I'll say if you need anything, uh, you probably need to figure yourself out because – Drawing requires a singular focus. You might need background noise. Maybe you need music or maybe you need Netflix or whatever. Um, but ideally, you need your senses to do this job. Yeah. Um, like, I never understood how Steve Dillon could, like, be in a pub and be such a good storyteller. That guy knew things. Oh, yeah. Uh, but not everybody's him. He's one dude. And I'm sure I've read a lot of really good comic books from stoners. I'm positive I have. <laughs> but, but if you are striving and you're trying to learn, being stoned is not the best way to do that. No. And I don't... Why would I waste the time and tell you what books help me if... And if you're not taking notes? One time... Uh, this is 99. I want to draw comics. I drew two sequential pages, which I had never done before. Before that, I was drawing characters because I was a kid. Um, Joe and Jimmy are signing Daredevil at Golden Apple Comics. This is about as late 90s as you get. So maybe it's 98, 99. Probably. Uh, so I went over there. Um, Joe gives me about five minutes of time. Says that's pretty good. That needs a lot of work. There's no depth in here, but he was polite. Uh, and I didn't take it personally. So he says, Jimmy, take a look at this. And so Jimmy starts talking to me, and the first thing I did was pull out a pen, and I started taking notes. And he saw that, and at that, he said, come back here. And he talked to me for 45 minutes. Wow. wow. That, that one interaction changed the way I read comics, it changed the way I looked at comics, and it was an introduction to a language that I didn't know existed, but I was very familiar with. That's crazy. That's be- phenomenal. Yeah. It was yeah. that it helped me more in forty-five minutes than anything ever did in forty-five minutes before or since. Yeah. And people like that, you need more people like that. Yeah. Who will talk to you about things? You know, I didn't know who Alex Raymond was before that. <laughs> you know. I had never sat there and thought, you know, I need to go find Al Williamson, like, <laughs> science fiction comics from the 70s. But then I saw them, and they weren't old comics anymore. Right. You know? They're like, uh, Sylvester used to call them these scrolls. These ancient scrolls he would open them up and he would <laughs> learn knowledge from. <laughs> was, yeah. But you gotta, you gotta, that's how you show respect if you're gonna ask a question. Yeah. Find a way yep. to keep that. And if you're putting it in your phone, explain to them that you're not texting someone and you're taking mm. notes. Yeah. Like, well, hey, I'm just letting you know I'm taking notes. Well, like you said, you don't want to waste people's time. And they don't I don't. want their time wasted. Yeah. So. Mm. so why wouldn't you? You know what I mean? But And try and avoid excuses. Except I see where you're coming from. And sometimes you don't. And if you don't, it's okay to go, I'm not quite sure I get it. Right. But don't argue yeah. There's nothing worse than being wrong, but arguing the point. Yeah, that, that's an irritant for me. I mean, the kids, you know, they come up and they want to tell you, like, they want to explain away the stuff that you know is clearly wrong. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I was doing it like this because this is, and I, that's when I kind of turn off. And I was thinking, well, you don't want to learn, right there. You you just told me you don't want to learn. You didn't say those words. But when you start explaining why I'm technically, you're telling me I'm wrong, mm-hmm. but you ask me for advice. So, you know, why are you here? 
Yeah. yeah. And especially in the last couple of years, you see a lot of people who are heavily photo referencing. But they uh-huh. don't have the fundamental skills to back that up. Right. So there's people who could do that. And then just the, the rule of, did you at least take your own pictures? Because that's important. It's not you're not tracing a photo, and the people that do trace a photo, it's very obvious. Oh yeah, and, and everybody's training knows. their eye either. If you're taking your own pictures, you're training your eye. You're looking at things. What am I looking for? Composition, uh, structure. You know, uh, storytelling. Because there's storytelling in photographs all the time. And there's an inherent uh, ability to understanding. Even if you took this photo, it doesn't look as cool as it if it were wrong. Right. And if you draw it a particular way, it doesn't matter if it's wrong. It's not about being cool, but it is about your style. Right. <coughs> a photo will never be your style. <laughs> Some people make styles out of it. Well. Some people. I see, like those people with the apps. I've seen one one kid come in. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's your app. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you took a bunch of pictures and put a filter on it. Yeah. <laughs> and then back in my head, I'm like, I'm out of a fucking job. Because <laughs> people don't, a lot of people Because then they'll be care. able to get that done in a week. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what about um, working with writers? Mm. Let's talk about that for a second. <coughs> you guys have, I mean, because typically, I think, when, you know, you get a job like this, Chris, whether it was, you know, front of me of the state, Ray, Moon Girl, Devil Dinosaur, you get a script from somebody, okay? Is it is it usually a completed script? Yes. And what's that what's that process like? I mean, do you like right, What do you, you mean by you complete? Have, you because <laughs> there's, you know, the two styles. Like there's a full script, <coughs> there's a Marvel style. Those are the, the two uh, ends of the spectrum. And then some writers write somewhere in between, you know. Um so, so Marvel, the Marvel method is still as relevant today as. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's kind of what I wanted to ask too. Like, what was the process like? Say, like, for if you get a professional job, what are the steps that break down to by the time you get the job to when you're turning into a final product? It kind always depends right? on who you're working with. Yep, and at what stage. I, uh, oh. um, if I get a real loose script, I like to pretend that they respect me enough to fill in the blanks reality he's probably writing that script as I'm drawing it yep but I like to pretend (laughs) (laughs) man this guy must really trust me because there's a lot of room here but like uh, the coolest gig one of the coolest gigs ever for me I did this uh, pilot season for Top Cow and I'm sitting I actually had to meet I was in the room with people which is always cool and uh, my editor at the time, who's no longer there, don't judge him on this, <laughs> um, he tells these two screenwriters, and more and more, you're working with people outside of comics, right? Yeah. I do all the time. Very rare I work with people who made their names in comics. Um, he's telling these two screenwriters, um, based off what I had done in front of me and the turnaround time, Budgetary reasons, he says, I think I found a shortcut. We will take this screenplay, and Chris can do this in 64 pages. Now, I didn't read it, (laughs) but I said, you know, give me an hour. Let me walk down, get a cup of coffee, I'm going to read this, and I'll come back, and we'll talk it out. So I went down, I got a cup of coffee, and I never opened it. I knew what the budget was. They had said what the page rate was, and it was nice. I did come back and I said, I can do it in 73 pages. I needed more pages. Mm. Uh, And I just, sometimes you got to test the water. Now, if they came back and said, do it in 64, I would have been like, all right. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, I worked long form, so I had to find the beats myself in the pages. And there is that. And that's, that you can't, Nobody naturally knows that. No. But that's where being full of shit helps you. <laughs> because you can tell a story. And so you sit there and you, you go, yeah, that's a good point to jump. That'll be a good page to end. That's how you end a page. And then, um, and then, especially in independent comics, when you work with editors that haven't 
ha- haven't had their hearts broken yet. Some of those guys don't even ask for layouts, which is insane to me. But the, usually the I next love step, those guys. Yeah. <laughs> usually the next step is, you know, you lay out. And that could be anything. Yeah. I didn't know I was rare that I actually do full-size layouts. What do you mean? On 11 by 17? Yeah. Yeah, that's rare. <laughs> yeah. Um, they're rough. They're real rough. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think Adam Arthur Adams does it. But really? On yeah, occasion, he, though. He also draws double size. Is he still drawing double size? Yeah. I don't know how he... Yeah. I mean, I'm on the other end of the spectrum. Like, now I have uh, eight and a half by yeah. Like, my thumbnails are small. Uh, my, uh, my layouts, my tight layouts are half, eight and a half by 11. And then... I go up to like you know whatever the proportion of size is uh, on eight and a half by eleven. So how much of the stuff are you doing on paper? Um, like now since I'm just penciling uh, these the things I'm working on, all of it's going to be like I would say eighty percent of it's on paper. Then I scan it in, mm-hmm. uh, see uh, six hundred DPI, mm-hmm. I clean it up in either Photoshop but mostly Manga Studio, which is like my everything. Um, and put it on a board, digital board, that is 11 by 17. So when it goes to the inker, they can print it out really nicely, mm-hmm. you know, on board, if that's what they want to do. Do you create a layer that actually has a scanned board in there? Yep, I made my own. Yeah. Yeah, like once you get into it, the digital thing, here's the thing. If you don't know how to draw, I don't care what program you have. You're just not going to be good. It's not, not going to look good. So, but I make I make it so it feels organic, but it's mm-hmm. you know it's not. You know, I, if I'm inking, then it's the other way around. I only do the thumbnails, and then that's it. You know, I, everything's digital. Um, but yeah, right now it's just pencils, so it's like eighty percent. See, I go the other way where I start everything digitally. Like all my blue line is digital, yeah. and then um, I don't know if I even have like tight pencils anymore so I only ink myself um, and I I need that spontaneity I need to make a mistake and then figure out how to fix that mistake um, so once I get that that blue line done I'll print that out on 11 by 17 board and then it goes right to the drafting table where I'm actually physically hand on paper I used to do that and I was like uh, and then I, but the only reason I'm doing things that way is I, st- I'm using my Studio Five. Um, it's still there's still that difference. Oh yeah, you, it's unmistakable. My touch is is different on a page than it is digitally, and I don't know why. I don't know where that that missing element is, but it's enough that it bugs me enough. And also, I lost a lot of money. On um, books where the page rate was really low, Zenoscope, and <laughs> low or um, no, <laughs> and uh, I could have made money by having original art to sell. People who read those books will buy original art, and I didn't have any because I was doing two pages a day. So there's no choice. Right. It'll clean it up if I don't have to worry about my ink line because I can just you know, Command Z. <laughs> then, yeah. Yeah. I can go fast. So you have a Mac. Yeah. That's how I can tell what people are using. Oh, Command-Z. That's a Mac. Control-Z, that's PC. Yeah. <laughs> what does yeah, Command-Z do? It, uh, it just, oh, sorry. It erases the line. Okay. <laughs> oh. It cut? Or For the undo? uninitiated. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah undo. It'll just, it'll just yeah, take out like your last undo. movement. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, hopefully, I always like it when they're just like, they give you that green light because they just want it done. So like, yeah, go. That's yep. the best time. That is the best. Yeah, that's right. Now, Free for all. Since that's like when you get like uh, some script in, how often do you go back and forth between like the writer or the editor getting pages or like between you turn something in or not? Honestly, it depends. You, rarely, you rarely talk to a writer. Wow. It I was the opposite for me. Oh, on, really? on Moon Girl, I was talking to Brandon Montclair and Amy Reader like daily. See, and that's what makes better comics. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it was, let me tell you, this is the best experience 
doing Moon Girl and Double Dinosaur is the best experience I ever had. You should work probably on a comic. this up because this is your, <laughs> your um, most recent issue, right? Yeah. And I mean, well, and I would say this: it it barely edged out working with uh, Vito Del Sante on that book, uh, the the action verse book, because that was the first time Vito worked Marvel style. Because you know, it's my character, but he has a certain connection with me. Uh, I don't know; it's weird. But I could just give him something loose, and he can turn that into something beautiful, you know. And we just went back and forth, so. You know, it kind of depends, you know, but, you know, all the other stuff I did before, I just got the script Mm -hmm. and I went to town and I I barely talked to the editors. I mean, as long as I was turning pages, it was cool. You ever go to war? With an editor? Or a writer? No. (laughs) No, And I don't want to. I was going to ask you guys if you (laughs) had any horror stories. (laughs) I wouldn't call it a horror story, but yeah, I went to war one time. Was it on something you depicted and they didn't agree? From the get go. Oh. Um, That's awful. A TV guy's got a lot of money. This happens often. A TV guy's got a lot of money, and he grew up loving comics. So he wants to make comics. But he's used to giving TV notes. So at every single stage, he has notes, and he doesn't understand what it takes to make a comic book. And so if I have my way, I'm going to take two or three days, and I'm going to lay out a whole issue. I'll, I'll send them out small. I make sure everything is clear enough so that they understand my storytelling, my composition. That's all I worry about. My acting will come in later. Um, I've never gotten so many notes. I wanted to die. It was bad. <laughs> so then I find out from another artist who's doing a book at the same studio, he's getting a lot of notes. Same writer? No but he's not getting those notes from the writer. He's getting this now. See, I was doing the studio owner's book, so I'm getting all the notes. Right. But this guy is looking over his editor's shoulder and saying, I don't like that. I don't even know what that is. And so I took it for a couple days. And then this dude who doesn't draw, and his television producer, not a writer, um... <laughs> He starts redlining things. And I was like, nah, dog. We need to have a conversation. <laughs> right. So I go down. What is redlining? He took, a like, a digital red marker. Re- okay, so that's exactly what it sounds like. Mm-hmm. Like, what the hell is this? Why is that? I don't like this. But none of these are a positive change. He's not informing me on what he would like out of these things. He's just saying no, which is a way to do it. Destructive instead of constructive. And so, right. and I'm not hearing from my editor. And then the editor I initially wanted to work with quit a week after I came on. <laughs> and so I was like, ooh, we're on the roller coaster yeah. now. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> Nobody's getting bored today. And so, and so, to this point, I had always been very passive, just happy to be at the party. And then I was like, you know what? What happens if I just burn down this party? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, I think I have a valid point, And now is the time to say that. So I say, well, this isn't working out now, is it? Now, you could let me go. And I'll shake your hand. You will find the guy that you want to do this. And no harm, no foul. Sorry it didn't work out. Or we could figure this out because I wanted the challenge Mm -hmm. I didn't it was never expressed to me what type of book this was I knew there was a humor element but this guy's playing it up big big and then and this happened a lot because I can do likenesses he starts casting the book and I was like fuck now it's gonna if you want a likeness that's gonna take several more hours a day because I need to see this guy from multiple angles it wasn't good and so what ends up happening and my editor is not standing up like and I told her I was like fire me you know and she's like no 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 we're gonna make this work I'm like all right so eventually I come down and I hook up my Mac to the thing and he starts just point what is this what is this and so I stand up and I go 
All right, here's how we'll do this. I will explain my points and you will explain yours. And these notes that you're coming up with, I'm telling you, every one takes me an additional three hours. This book won't just be late. I don't understand what I'm drawing. Uh, and here's why. This is how comic books work. And he was pissed. He was mad. And that's fine. Uh, and when I left, um, I expected a call. I didn't think he'd fire me to my face. Mm -hmm. I expected the call, though. <laughs> and that's going to happen. But I stood up for myself. Because yeah. you have to. Um, and I don't... It, maybe my tone is coming out wrong. I don't disrespect anybody that that was in that room. But I got a call from the guy working on the other book. And he goes, yo, I'm like, what's up? Did you just tell him he didn't know comics? And I was like, yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, because the editor just called and she apologized to me. And I was like, really? And he's like, yeah. And then I said I'm out at issue four. <laughs> and I was like, all right, cool. And so we had that conversation, and we still had problems. But then, like, then it was like, well, every month we'll break down this story together, which was bullshit. And so um, I had started on issue three because the first guy quit, um, who's now a, a, he, working on fairly solid mar Marvel books. And so I start on three. End of three, um, this armored truck exploded on Santa Monica Pier. But it's an armored truck, you know? There's going to be an explosion and, like, a hole, and some of it's going to fall into the ocean. I didn't know that. And, like, he had one character. His roommate was, like, this big fat guy. And there were constantly fat jokes that just didn't work. And then he, like, was kissing him on the mouth like Bugs Bunny. And I'm like, that looks like they now have a... A, a fairly homosexual relationship you've never kissed your buddy on the mouth I think I mean if you have I'm not here to judge you I'm saying I haven't because I'm a prude no um, <laughs> and, uh, and uh and then it goes straight to like I didn't we and then he's like no the, the, like issue four starts and this is like west coast 9-11 is what he said and I was like oh Jesus and I looked at my editor, and my editor did not know what issue four was about. And I was like, oh, this will be my last issue. Yep. So let's just humor this guy and walk away clean. Uh, to his credit, he always ran uh, an up-and-up -up business. He paid regularly, and he paid well. Um, I don't know who would be a good fit. I know after I left, there was almost another artist every issue. Wow. Um, so part of that was your editor isn't involved. And there's things that I, I've learned from that. Like, I genuinely think it's fine for the people you work with to be involved in other things. There's no other aspect of comic books that are going to take the time that drawing the damn thing does. But... Yeah, every time every time I see like a writer and they're like, "Oh, I'm making a movie or I'm doing this," and I'm like, "Oh shit, <laughs> here we go." <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's you know. But then I've had other situations where you know your editor has gotten a bat for you, and if you didn't give a hundred percent, you should feel like shit about yep. that because they're going to bat for you. Your editor is your boss, and it's not a boss if you work at Best Buy or anywhere else. This is somebody who believed in you enough to put their reputation on the line to hire you to their bosses. Yep. Yeah. Now, we get on, on our podcast, uh, I, I know for for some time now, we give Marvel editorial a lot of shit. Yeah. I picked um, up on that. Uh-oh. Should, <laughs> should I leave? <laughs> no. No. No, um, I mean. No, and it's we, just. We give credit where credit's due also. Oh, right? sure. But. But, but they have bosses it, too. It seems yeah. Yes, like, they do. It seems like, you know, um, in 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 my mind, that 
that writers and artists are kind of hamstrung. Like you know, a great a great example would be Jonathan Hickman's um, Secret Wars run and and everything leading up to it. And you know, in the middle of the story, you have Thanos come in, and and he has a son. It's like it seems so. Well, force fed. Yeah, yeah, like it wasn't it wasn't meant to be in there, yeah. but somebody wanted it in there, and so. Hickman had to kind of insert this into his story. Sharp left turn. Okay. So, but my my, my question is, what, because for me, Marvel editorial, it's, it's like, you know, the wizards behind the curtain. Okay. But I want to know, what exactly is an editor's job? And, I mean, I'm assuming from the sound of it that they're just middlemen. No. Mm, no. Yeah, they're not. They need to be the smartest person on the book. Really? They're cat wranglers, too, you know. Yeah. Okay. You, you have no idea the amount of shit these people are given. Yep. They're given more excuses from more different angles than anybody else you've ever met. Now, a good editor can make an all right book a great book. Yep. And you will find your examples of if there's a lot of good books, <coughs> a lot of that has to do with the editor. Like, prime examples. A few years ago um, when uh, Brubaker and, and Fraction were doing this, the B and C level uh, Marvel books, listen, that was a renaissance and nobody knew about it. Right. Yeah. And that was because of Warren Simons. That's a smart guy who knows comics and knows how to pull the best out of those personalities. You have to be able to manipulate. You have to be able to thrust forward and sometimes you do have to be the bad guy but on the opposite end of that it's not that you're a middleman it's that and we'll take Marvel for instance it's not that David Gabriel is a bad guy for wanting certain things to happen at a certain time it's that there is an enormous amount of pressure um, on top of which they have a budget now you might want uh, I'm trying to think. You might want Greg Capullo on a Wolverine book. Everybody would want Greg Capullo on a Wolverine <laughs> book. Greg Capullo is not going to draw a Wolverine book for whatever the Wolverine bu book budget is right now. There are puzzle pieces in editorial where there are high demands put upon you and you are doing your best on a regular basis to put together stories that people remember for a very long time and you're doing it on the tightest deadline and budget you can and sit you're there doing and, it for eight other titles yeah and, or more and at the same time your assistant editors uh, don't always have the experience so you're working with them too now that's a lot of personalities and when those things blow up it falls on the editor yep it won't fall on upper management and shareholders don't give a shit. Wow. That's why, as the artist, and it doesn't matter, it's not just Marvel, it's any book. As the artist, your job is to make their job easy. Er, it'll never be easy. I wouldn't want to be an editor. I don't know enough about comics to be an editor. I don't know enough about literature to be an editor. <laughs> but that's, that's the thing. They have to be able to spot when the lighting's, lighting's wrong. They have to be able to spot just errors in the timeline they have to make sure the costumes are right and now that's hard yeah. which uh, speaks I'm surprised no one caught that in Monsters Unleashed number one there's, a, there's a Spider-Man mistake in there yeah. so one page <laughs> they drew Peter and yeah. it should have been they colored Peter, <laughs> Peter and it should have been Miles, Miles. Uh. so here, here's the thing about all of that <laughs> so I had to do um, well, one of the biggest conversations we had on that book was the thing. So the thing is part of the Guardians of the Galaxy now. Uh, but the script called for shorts. Like he's wearing his shorts. But we want, I know it's Disney in my mind. So I asked my editor, like, should I design something for, like, what's he wearing? What's Ben wearing? Uh, because the cover shows you old school, right? That's not what's in the book. So I was like, well, what are we going to do? So for like almost four days, I'm back and forth. We're talking about designs. Is he going to have the jumpsuit on? Is he going to, you know. But in the, the last page 
uh, the issue before that, issue 13, he's just got the trench coat, so you don't know what he has, but his feet are exposed. In Guardians, he has boots. So I'm like, okay, uh, what's going to happen? So here's where communication is key. It makes everything better. Between me, Brandon, and uh, our editor, Chris Robinson, we basically came up with these shorts that were Guardian-themed, still exposed his feet, and, uh, you know, kept the continuity. And that's the kind of thing that, that's what editors do. Editors make sure everything works between corporate and creative. Mm -hmm. You know, they're big band leaders. And some editors are great at picking talent, like they're great casting. So that alleviates some of their burden as far as wrangling the cats. And then some are better at the manipulation aspect where they're making you better because they could see something in you and they know that you would be right for something, but maybe you're not there or whatever the situation is. So um, you end up getting a, a great editor uh, that pushes you, uh, makes you better, sometimes argues with you a little bit, but they're going to pull the best out of you. And those guys, like you keep working with those guys and they keep making you better. Those are the, the editors that make superstar creative teams. So instead of just picking an awesome already creative team. And I, you know, I mean, uh, so talking about Marvel editors, okay. I'm on the, the opposing side where, you know, I had uh, worked with great Marvel editors. I, I've never worked with a bad editor, not one time. Like usually they, they're, in, they're going to bat for you. Um, you know, they're like, okay, we want you to do this. We think you'd be great for this. Here is this thing that we know you would be really good for. They're thinking about you because they want you to shine because if you shine they shine and that's why you know like Chris was saying like you want to do your best work especially for a good editor and you know maybe sometimes things don't work out but um, if your editor is good to you like it pulls out some great shit and also if you say you've done six solid issues for that guy and they got to figure out who's going to draw the next six issues say you were getting 225 a page you have worked your ass off it will be acknowledged and he yep. may not be able to get you much more but he's far more likely to argue the point for you because you're not gonna you're not gonna get to talk to those guys the money guys no there's an offer and if you can't take it the next guy in line will there's a thousand guys you know waiting in line to get your job and you know people tell you don't think about it like that but you can't help it because mm -hmm. you know those guys. Those are the guys that are talking to you right now about how to get in. They want your job, you know. And I, I get that I'm going to keep everything close to the vest. I get it, but I don't do it because I don't believe in it. Mm -hmm. You know, I understand it, but I don't believe it. My job is to be beyond reproach. My job is to be so good that I'm the first person that they think to do it. And flexible. And flexible. You've got to be flexible. You know what I mean? Like, um... Because have an opinion, but don't drown it. Well, that's, and when they invite you to the table of opinion and say, well, what do you think? You know that you've done a good, you've earned your spot. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you get it, it can be revoked if you, you know, misuse it. So use your podium wisely. Yeah. And also understand that if you get that shot, like I would love that shot, but I also know if they ask me to come in and and work on something like I'm trying to think off the top of my head as I start looking around like <laughs> you have three and a half weeks to do an issue of Gamora which can happen they sometimes I think they want to light the fire under your ass to they see do. if you can and if you can't that book was going to be late anyways trial by fire <laughs> but say they do that is not the time to start spouting opinions right. like there's a reason Spider-Man Deadpool is a unique voice those two have worked together on and off since 1997 and they know how that works I bet you there's not a ton of notes I'm, I've read some of those scripts I know there's notes in the script because <laughs> Joe's having a good time and he knows those, those notes are coming um, but you can't expect to get on there and 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 expect that same freedom. Just because you do the same job does not mean you are the same person. 
Trust yes. is everything. Remember that. Anybody listen to this thing, watching this? Remember that. You can do the same book, but you are not getting treated the same. You haven't earned it. Yeah. And there's no ego. You just can't have an ego in it. You're right. Exactly. But, you know, what are you going to do? You do your best work, and eventually you're asked, like you said, if you're lucky. Yeah. Sometimes a job's a job. And as much as you would love, like, for the longest time, after Morrison until four months ago, anybody drawing Doom Patrol wanted to make a great Doom Patrol. Nobody gets on Doom Patrol wanting to make a piece of shit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I would love to take a character I don't like and make something cool out of it. Yeah, that's the dream. Honestly. Like, like Booster Gold? I've never read a Booster Gold story where I was like, dude, Booster Gold is awesome. I like you, Chris, but you start talking about Booster. But <laughs> I've got, but now, do I have a Booster Gold story? I bet you I do. <laughs> like, I know I do. You find those characters you don't like. I'll yeah. tell you right now, if, if I've tried out for three or four DC books now in the last year, haven't got it, so read into that as much as you like. That's <laughs> take my advice. Uh, <laughs> The one book, if I could do a miniseries tomorrow and it wasn't one a Wildstorm character, um, I would want to do a DC Bride of Frankenstein book. Uh, those designs are awesome. It's horror, it's steampunk, it's different, and there's not anything like that from that publisher right now. Because if you're on a book with no pressure, they think it's going to be six issues and call it a day, they're going to give you a little more leeway. And when you get just a little bit of leeway, let the style go. Loosen up a little bit. Have fun. If nobody's watching, what do you lose? Next Wave. Yeah. Next Wave was like that for Stuart. So yeah, just take the big swing. Yeah. Because why not? If a book's going to end in six issues, you better be damn proud of those six issues. Yep. That's a good tip. And it's, you learn so much on, on situations like that because you get to experiment. It's so fun, dude. It's so fun. And then you take that away. Usually what happens is that's the thing you get known for. Ever notice that? Like, you just start going crazy on something. It's like, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to change this style. I'm going to add this little costume design change. People are like, dude, that was cool. You see that? That was cool. And then that's what you get hired on your next job. It's like C.B. Sabolsky told me, you're only as good as the last page. So if the last thing you did was sh- shit, then people are going to be like, eh, it's kind of a shit artist. You and know? people know when you phone it in. Yeah, all the, yeah they know. The, the, <laughs> the magic is to, you know, phone it in, but you're so good. Like, you already know. You have a shorthand. And you're able to do some key things. It still looks good. And your sales are good and everything's good. But you know, as the artist, what you did and did not do. Mm-hmm. But if they don't know... You've done it. You're, you know, a magician. Wasn't there a Black Panther commission that you had done? Something, I, I, I think I remember this conversation. Black we had Panther and Storm? Were, yeah. It was something, <laughs> it was a technique that you were kind of experimenting with, and it caught Marvel's eye. Uh, oh, yeah. They saw, uh, it was a commission, a lot of commission stuff, right? Like, uh, they saw the Black Panther Storm thing I thought was pretty cool. Um, but I was experimenting with some watercolor thing or whatever. Um, you know, a lot of people notice the, the color commissions I do. Um, I think somebody at DC noticed a bad girl commission I did um, with the new, like, motorcycle jacket design. Right. Um, you know, and that's a place uh, Chris and I have the opposite problem. Like, I can't crack DC. I know maybe one person, maybe, but maybe they moved to Marvel now. I don't know. But I can't, I can't get in. And I, there's characters at DC I want to draw. Um, but I just can't crack it. I can't get in there for some reason. And me either, fool. Well, <laughs> but at least you're well, talking you're to people. Out. Like, right. Like, you'll, you'll be in before you know it. And you know they have that new showcase thing coming up. I, that's something I actually want to talk about. Well, we'll talk about that. Right? Yeah. I, I, got, I got a few stories on that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Not firsthand. Things I'm hearing, though. See, and I, I know two people that got in there. And, um, yeah. Yeah, we got to talk. Cool. So... That would be something like you're. I'm pretty sure you know it's a matter of time because they're already looking at you, and they're trying to see what you do. But it's what you said. Like you get a trial by fire, right? Like my guy. I started at Marvel in 2007, and uh, Roger, 
you met the guy that we you know so kevin. yeah so so kevin and i and kevin and i no, had known each other a little while and, and we finally got you know i got in there and uh i hadn't heard from them in a year i did spider-man family issue eight and that was you were talking about like stuff that artists deal with like i was depressed uh you know for about two months straight and I was like, I'm gonna quit. I'm gonna become a teacher. I'm just, you know. After after having finished the issue, after finished the issue and nothing, crickets. Yeah. Because yeah. I, well, you know, you everybody have to feel like that's when you get that first book. Well, done. you worked hard every gig. Yeah. Every gig, you feel like I'm in. Yep. I can't wait to see what happens next, and then nothing. And happens. nothing. Cricket. Crickets. Crickets. So you know, and I was like, because you're told when you're starting out, breaking in, breaking in, breaking in. No one ever tells you the other side. Staying in is 10 times harder than breaking in. I didn't get my next Marvel work for, you know, over a year. And then I stayed in there for about two years and, and did a few things. And then I did Midnight Tiger and I took time off um, and, you know, heard some bad advice anyway. But I still did um, Midnight Tiger, which was a, a good thing. Uh, but the problem comes, man, is when you get back and you've done stuff before, the whole regime change. You don't know anybody there anymore. You don't know. I mean, I only knew one editor that was still there, and we tried to break back in. That was tough, man. The people who were going to back for you, back for you, you know, they're gone. So you have to forge new relationships, that whole networking thing again, and that was tough. So getting back to um, the whole trial by fire thing and, and what you can do. Like my first, my first job actually was um, a Prowler cover, the hip hop. The hip hop. I saw that. Right. So. First of all, I was like, oh my God, you know, <clears throat> to start, I'd never done a cover for Marvel. And uh, to start with that type of variant, mm -hmm. yeah. I'd never done a cover for them before. I was like, wow, it's awesome. It was yeah. like, it was yeah. huge. Um, and I thought, you know, I was prepared at this point. I was like, this is it. This is the only thing I'm going to be doing for a while. But I was, um, you know, doing storyboards for Guardians of the Galaxy and stuff like that. So I was cool. Like, I didn't wasn't a big deal if I didn't work or not you know it was fun just to do it then I got another call you know uh, basically it's like oh we got this um, Red Widow story uh, that we're doing and it's basically uh, 10 pages in two weeks pencils and inks uh, I was like wow well, well let's call it. I'm gonna stop what I'm doing because I want to be back in mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I bust that whole thing out, um, but I didn't think about it. There was no argument. There was no talking. It was, and that was with getting the entire pages rejected. So I got, you know, and that's corporate. So it's like, oh yeah, you know, um, the heads don't feel like this one page. It's okay, but it's not what they wanted. I had to do, you know, talk about turnaround time. I penciled and inked an entire page in a day, and and by day I meant like six hours. But I thought it was one of the best pages in the whole thing. Mm -hmm. and I, but by then, I mean, I don't know if, if you're like me, but I have a warm-up time, right? So I'm not as fast in the beginning as I am, you know, towards the middle. Um, but by that time, I was smoking. I knew the character. I had an idea. I had a vision. I was, you know, it's good to go. And then uh, stuff just start rolling in. And that's when they knew he can get stuff in on time, you know, and all this other kind of stuff. So... Um, and that, of course, they've been looking for stuff for me, and I get the Moon Girl thing and other things that are in the ether that you were talking about. Yeah. So, uh, but you got to prove yourself every time, mm -hmm. every time. And and that's the thing that I don't like about the entertainment industry we were talking about before. It's one of the few jobs that no matter what you did, your resume or whatever, you always have to audition for. I mean, unless you're a superstar, you know. There's two two other books at Marvel that you mentioned. I know you can't divulge any any uh, any secret information, any hints. No. I mean, you know, I am the only one I can talk about, um, which uh, is Moon Girl. I am going to be doing another Moon Girl thing at nice. some point. Very cool. Um, you know, sometime in 2017. I don't know when, but you know. But the other things I'm working on, I I would love to tell you. Cool. I, to you make know. you happy. Uh, you know what? Yes. One thing is, is there, just fun. Is there a timeline that we can expect those to be out? Uh, um, Early seven, 2017, later 2017? Mm, just in the air? 
Well, the the Marvel thing, um, which is probably what I can talk a little bit more about than the other other thing, the Marvel thing that is supposed to start um, pretty soon. So you you know we'll be able to see it. I mean, it's a fun thing. It's fun. That's um, actually I think that's actually a really great question because it kind of goes to what kind of what kind of lead time <laughs> is there between? <laughs> He's already laughing. Between, <laughs> Like, you, I got yeah. Who knows? I, yeah. Between when you're drawing it uh-huh. and when it hits the comic shelves, how much time is that usually? <laughs> well, is it creator-owned or is it corporate? No, we'll say two. it's corporate. Yeah, big two. <sighs> well, if you're a superstar, then they give you a lot of lead time. I would, I would argue against that, though. Really? Uh, I heard the second hint okay. that a big guy... One of my favorite current artists. Uh, he was working. I can't remember what series he was working on, but they wanted him for a big crossover. Mm. He draw a ton of characters. They were willing to give him this really nice page rate, really nice, like top of the line Marvel page rate, which is a lot of money. Um, He didn't have any more lead time than if this book was out in th- three or four weeks. Like really? he was, and they were like, well, and and one of the editors, and sometimes an editor will say something, and they're just trying to, they're not trying to get a reaction, but they're trying to make a point. And somebody said, well, it's not like you draw a million backgrounds. Uh, okay. And he was pissed. He, now that being said, he took the gig. Um. But and I heard that it's been a while. So I heard this back in 2011. But from what I hear, listen, if you have five issues of Unworthy Thor, which is one of my favorite Marvel books right now. Yep. That book's as good as anything on the shelf anywhere and I'm not even a Thor guy. Yeah. That book's fantastic. Next issue is a filling artist. Yeah. That's that's how it rolls. And and I don't feel, from what I see online, it's not like Koypel's going on vacations. I knew that's who you were talking about. I didn't say he was the only guy. No, but remember, like, Bleeding Cool, they have a lot of stuff that they talk about. And that was one of the big things about the changes and who's going to fill in and stuff like that. So when you started talking about it, then you dropped on what you threw. I was like, ah, I knew it is. So here's the thing about that. And I – and. If it's a guy who, and he's a superstar, hands yeah. down. And, so and has earned it. And, it oh, is, yeah, he's a badass. I mean, dude's amazing. Lighting, storytelling, composition, character design, he's, he knows what he's doing. When they talk about backgrounds, like, when he does do backgrounds, they're phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? But his storytelling is so strong. Yeah, you're never lost. Yeah, you're not lost. You don't even need to do backgrounds i don't know what school like it used to be this whole stigma right where uh you know yeah every page you have to have an establishing shot you remember that like they just tell I you still do it. you still do it yeah. some people you know they do it and they stick to it and it's great um but then that's when you start developing who you are as an artist you know and it is it can work you know if you know what you're doing not doing backgrounds i mean you know every establishing shot or whatever if your storytelling is strong and you have done kick ass the, one, the same scene, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody's there. Everybody knows what's popping there. But if your storytelling is weak and you don't do it, you're a lost. Yeah, I think you're you can lost. Get, you can get through that. Uh, one of my favorites. I have that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, especially songs you don't break 180. Yeah, right. That's that's half the battle. So you can get away with it. I don't have the confidence to not. And see, you know what? I I think that happened to me. When I started studying film to do storyboards, it changed my world. I was, it was inherent, but when I knew the rules mm-hmm. to not break them, like the 180 rule, if I see it broken anywhere else, it bugs the shit out of me. Yeah, I just mean, you know? like, like background-wise. Well, that's the thing. Backgrounds, though, since they're another character, here's the issue with that. Like, they're another character, mm-hmm. and, and you got to follow along with backgrounds. Um, that being said, though, <laughs> the last thing you want to do is spend three hours referencing what an HVAC unit looks on the roof of a building. I'm and guilty. Then, and then, oh, I do it. <laughs> yeah. But then 
you see the book and you're like, I spent two hours finding the math in this. <laughs> and I, that letter needed that space. I just wasted three hours of my life. This podcast, I'm sorry, this podcast right now is, is I would, if I was half dead, which I kind of was, I would come here just for this. Because <laughs> that's what he said kills me every time, dude. Like, and, you, it's, and it's not always the letter's fault. No. I mean, it's sometimes I have left some open space <laughs> and I'm like, I want the, I'll even pencil in the balloon. Like, <laughs> number six goes there. Don't. Fuck with me today, <laughs> right? And then they do it anyways, and I'm like, I never yep. wronged you. Right. I never wronged you. Why did you do this to me? I, I call that a font whip. Like you got font whipped because sometimes the the writer, the blurb in there, especially with corporate comics, they go back and the writer goes and rewrites, and you know what you got in the script, but then you go back and see that, and then it's like uh, prose, like whatever it is. It's like, dude. I, that whole panel took me four hours, you know, but here's the soliloquy, you know, that you have. But the beauty of creator on comics is like uh, we were talking about before this started, we were talking about Killer Be Killed, mm. where he has those splash pages that are really like half pages, yep. which are, have got to be great for him to get them out. Oh, speed they're always awesome. it, And they're always beautiful and they fit this style. Him, the three of them, especially in a book like that. Your colorist is important. Yes. And if you have a say, first off, be thankful if you ever have a say in who your colorist is. I've been asked once. Once. And and thankfully, I got the guy I wanted. Just for that cover. Um, I was so happy. But other than that, I've never had a say. And, like, I wouldn't want to trash other people because I know... Sometimes you don't know. Like, sometimes a colorist... I was on a book... And we had to do seven pages that night. Oh. And Crunch I say time. we because it was a, a committee. <laughs> <clears throat> this guy had pushed himself off, and we're working on seven pages to get this issue done in time. Now, we know that's almost half a book, which means if we're sending, if we're, the inker was in the room, he's inking as fast as he can, the guy I'm working with doesn't want me to help ink. Mm. He's like, at the time, he said, you're either a penciler or an inker, which I hated, but he's the boss. And now, if you have seven pages to do that night, it is not the night to argue. So you do it, and then you have to understand this guy is getting seven pages in his inbox, and they need to be done by 1150 so that somebody else can take the the layer of letters that were lettered off a copy of the pencils, put them together in production office, and then send that to the printer that afternoon. Yep. You cannot blame a colorist for turning in a page that's not a hundred percent. All flats. Hey, sometimes. Yep. Although sometimes flats look beautiful. If you get a, a very um heavy inked page flats are the best mm-hmm. moonshine yeah mm-hmm. that's, that's the best it's beautiful so like someone like uh, let's go back to Sean Murphy his stuff looks best with flat colors yeah with the occasional highlight here and there but is that Hollinsworth on most of his stuff now <sighs> you know what that sounds weird what's I'm he doing now because that was Tokyo Ghost is lasting now he's about to start doing yeah. all star Batman that's what it is yeah. He's got his own Batman book coming out soon, right? He's probably won't two. be probably won't be till next year. Till right. next year that it actually comes out. I I'm looking forward to that. I haven't spoken to him, but that's I follow him on Twitter and I just saw a little thing yeah. post. I wasn't sure if it was All Star because I remember he had mentioned he he's gonna be doing two books. He's got his own and then he's doing an all star run. Yeah. So I saw that too. But, um we're getting close to the end. Uh do you guys have any tips for any young artists? Don't you do can it. Kind of don't do it. Right. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> I have one more question. I have one more question too. So. I don't know. Okay. Ask. Um, oh, yeah. 
Well, we just mentioned before uh, we started here that like Superman was a hard character to write or draw. Mm. Um, so, in regards to that, would you say characters in masks or costumes would be easier than people like Superman, where it's just their face or something like that? No, no, no. <laughs> no I feel like when you have iconic characters, mm-hmm. there everyone has an opinion on what that character should be like, yep. and especially if you're breaking in. Nobody wants to see your Spider-Man. Just, you do the best Spider-Man you can do. You don't need to put your thumbprint on it right now. Yep. Um, You know, especially when a character has been um, drawn several ways. I don't know if you feel this way, Ray, but like, like for me, Batman. It, It has taken me a long time to figure out who my Batman is. I'm still finding that out. Yeah, like you got a good Batman. I've seen your commissions on Batman, but I don't. I'll be honest. I mean, we talked about this. I don't like it. Like, I don't. I don't think it's the one. I don't think it's mine. Okay. I, I think somewhere in there, there's. I'm. I'm doing a riff of someone else's Batman, mm-hmm. right? But of course, like you said, that's what we start. You start. You have a base, right? And you want to do your own. But you so let's take Spider Man. Like I have a Spider Man. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm very familiar with that Spider-Man, but I think if you're gonna, if you're a new guy, you do a Ditko Spider-Man, you do a McFarlane Spider-Man, and newly you do a Ramos Spider-Man. That's it, or it's you know whatever your style is. But that mask, like it's it's just as hard as doing Superman to me, mm-hmm. um, because it's iconic. So you're dealing with that. I mean, for you, if let's say you said you had a Batman, right? Like you have. I do, but I'm not. It ain't there. Yeah. See, so like, I... uh, but and and what's <laughs> shocking is like, uh, um, I wanted my Batman to be a Jim Paro Batman, but nice. now I'm gonna say, unfortunately, and it's not a slam on what the biggest influence seems to be on my Batman, but my, it seems like when I draw Batman, the biggest influence is the Arkham City Batman. Oh, really? And I don't know where that comes from. <laughs> it's in the back of Noodle, man. Hours and Video and hours games. and hours. Uh, and and I'm, not, I'm, not a, I'm not the biggest gamer. I mean, I play. But, uh, yeah, I was as surprised as anybody where I was, you know, you noodle and you noodle and you, you draw and eventually that pencil gets heavier and heavier until you're carving something into the page. <laughs> yep. Uh, Paper shredded. <laughs> and, uh, and, yeah, I really thought... I wanted my Batman to look like a modern version of Batman 409. Oh. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. uh, he was slim and he's kind of lanky. Uh, his ears are about as big as they ever need to be. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a hard character. And then Superman. Uh, I'm still figuring that out. Superman, I'm closer to than, than Batman. Like, I like a short-eared Batman. I like, uh, you know... Frank Miller Batman, um, and you've seen some of the Batman commissions. Like it's every time I draw Batman, he's gritty. He has this little stubble, yeah. you know, um, because he's out at night. He doesn't have time <laughs> to do anything else. He hasn't. He doesn't have the Bruce Wayne mask on, right? <laughs> so, um, and he's athletic. Like he's bulkier. Although I used to draw my Batman more lean, as if uh, he was a little bit um, more built, Grayson. Mm-hmm. But now I, you know, I'm somewhere in between the bulky and the lean, you know. Um, and I, I like the short ear. Every time I draw the short ear, though, it's like, dude looks like Black Panther. Mm-hmm. I hate it. Like so, I every time then I extend it because then I feel like I'm not being authentic. You don't want to extend those ears. Why are you doing that? Because it looks like Batman, but that's not your Batman. So that's that's where I'm at. But with Superman, I think I, I wanted something. In between, um, I would say, Burn and McGinnis. Okay. You know, somewhere in between that. Like, I, even though, like, when I draw them, I try to draw them a little bit more angular, a little more farm boy, you know, kind of like, uh, not too square a jaw, mm-hmm. just a little slightly round with the cleft. Yeah. Yeah. I. That's what I like, because... Uh, he seems like the Superman I grew up with. Like the the, and I don't, I never really liked Superman. I didn't hate Superman, but 
I've read some good Superman stories. That's like, okay, that Superman I like. Um, some of them would get too dark for me. Are you reading the Pete Tomasi stuff right now? No, I've stayed away from it, but I did you read. It? <laughs> it's good. Is it? Is it really it's good? So good, dude. It just makes you happy. Okay, it's, the, it's probably the best book coming out of DC. You, you'll take one home with you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, because I read. Um, Especially as a father, I think it'll speak to you on dude. a higher level than me. Well, that's why I can't wait for the the sons. Super, super, super sons. sons. I've been man. I've been <laughs> chomping at the bit for that book. Okay, you need you, you need, need these book. books right. as foundation for that, and and they're solid gold. Okay, I mean it's I'm, my it's my favorite super. You Bad haven't book. steered me wrong yet, right? So, you know, but yeah, <laughs> I'm right. looking for a good super. Bad book. On that note, I think we should wrap up because we've been going for a little over two hours now. Oh, so. you sure you don't want to ask your last but, question? My last question. Yeah, because we be we, we, we stopped on on we'll be done tomorrow. The <laughs> last question. Uh, so yeah, you had one more. Beer run. Tips. Oh, the tips. Yeah, yeah, we could do some quick tips. Quick right? tips for the hell do I know? Uh, <laughs> take notes. <laughs> yeah. Don't take be, notes. Yeah, that was a big one. Don't, don't waste time. time. Yeah. Don't waste people's time. You know? Approach it like a job, a job you want, not a job like, and not just that. You need to draw for fun. And not just for fun, but you need to find a way to make things that are not fun, fun. Mm -hmm. But you have to draw for fun, because if you're not, it comes across as stiff, and you won't find that. Uh, I personally, for me, um, if I need to focus at when I'm doing layouts or whatever, um, I need to find the right music. And personal styles, whatever, if you want to listen to thrash metal and that's what gets you there then do that but i have a real weird mix that i always fall back to that's somewhere between uh al green radiohead and a couple new indie bands uh depending on what i'm doing but i need a a mellow because i'm so anxious all the time I yeah I'm gonna go backwards so yeah music music is important I I don't know what it is but I find that if I'm listening to music I'm more productive if I'm not what gets you there uh, I'm not like you like it depends on what I'm drawing sometimes I'll listen to some hard gangster rap sometimes I'll listen to 80s I'm listening to Billy Joel like yesterday um, you know or uh, I think one of my playlists I have Anya. So, you know, but it's a mix. It just depends on what I'm drawing or how I'm feeling that day. Um, yeah, because I think if I'm really, really pumped, uh, like I listen to Eminem. Mm -hmm. I listen to Eminem when I'm pumped. I really want to get my juices going. And I got to bang out pages. That's what I'm listening to because that beat, it's the beat that keeps yeah. me going. But also it's important that, like, the way you're talking about music should also be applied to art where – Labels should never be important. Yeah. If you can get that feeling, like, you know, there's no real difference between Led Zeppelin and Chance the Rapper if you're trying to, if it, if it's giving you what you need. Yep. Yeah. It's lighting the fuse, man. That's, that's really it. Um, as far as production, I mean, like, uh, the tips to just get you going as far as art is concerned, um, pay attention. Pay attention to life. Everything you mm -hmm. do is art. You're going to use it. If you're drawing comics, everything you do, everything you see, you're going to reproduce it some way, somewhere. Go to Denny's and put on headphones, but don't listen to anything. And right. And draw the people talking. Yep. You'll know who has the more important point, and you don't even need to know what they're saying. That's storytelling. Hmm. You know what's really important? Good. That everybody starting out should know that very few of us actually follow. And this year, this is one of my big goals. When the year I got serious about drawing comic books, I gained 50 pounds. Yeah. If you can break those habits before they start, stress will make you eat. Long days will make you not stand up and walk around. Devote yourself, especially midday. If you're lucky enough that you're not working a job and you're actually working at home and doing this, midday, do your hand stretches. Stand up, stretch your back, go to the gym for a half hour and just walk. Even if you start out heavy and your knees hurt, just walk. Walk at your own pace. Self-care is as important as 
whatever drawing skill you have. Yep. Take a break. Because this job could be unhealthy. You either live a long time in this job or you die fast. Mm. I got to lose another 40 pounds. <laughs> yeah. I'm on the other end. I got I got about 100 pounds to lose. But it happens yeah, because you uh, want to draw. Yeah, yeah. That's it. I mean, And that's the opposite. But you have to make yourself. That's it. Cool. Guys, thank you so, thank much, you so much for, for being a part down. of this. Yeah. And shout out to, to Marcus, and Leo, or Marcus and Leo for uh, yeah, thanks, doing guys. all the filming and whatnot. They can reach you at uh, Big Time Super Friends, right? Cool. <laughs> Thank you guys for subscribing. I guess so, yeah. we'll see you on Thursday, the normal time. Well, I think it'll be up for Patreons first. Patreon's going to yeah, be first. Yeah, that'll get it first. Cool. We'll let everybody know about it. Yeah. All right. You guys have a good one.